So let me introduce Jim Keller now. Jim is the CTA and president of TensTorrent, which is a next generational computing company addressing compute demands for software 2.0. Prior to TensTorrent, Jim is a, you know, worked at Intel, AMD, Tesla, uh, PSMI, Apple, um, and Broadcom, to name just a few, <clears throat> and has cr helped create today's most iconic technologies, which is AMD Zen, K7, K8, the Apple processors, the hardware transport, and has worked closely with TSMC. So Jim, welcome. Thank you very much. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, great. <clears throat> All right. Let's see if we have any slides here. Is it going to come up? One more click. Oops. There we go. <clears throat> Title slide. So uh, yeah, I'm very happy to be here. And I was asked to give a talk, and they said the theme was innovating digital transformation. And I was thinking, like, in, I think of innovating as the incremental, steady improvement, and then transformations as the revolutions in technology. And I've been designing computers for 40 years, and it's interesting to look back about how we've made steady progress sometimes, and then we run into walls, and then there's been complete transformations of how we do it. So I wanted to talk a little bit about like that and then talk about AI because AI is literally the biggest transformation I've seen. It's bigger than the internet, it's bigger than mobile, and it's gonna change everything we do. Uh, a couple months ago I was down at UT and talking to some of Yale Path students and for people who don't know, Yale Path's a really great computer architect and he's, he's graduated an unreasonable number of really good students and uh, they've had a really big impact on the industry. And he asked me, you know, what's your top priority in computer design today? And I was thinking, that's a really complicated question because it's changed so much. And then the students wanted to know, what's the difference between a CPU and a GPU and a GPU and an AI accelerator? And why are they different? And is it going to change a lot? Is there a stable code base? What's going on in AI? And we had a really interesting conversation. It struck me just how much this has changed over time and just looking ahead how much it's going to change. So, if I think back on computers, you know, as a microarchitect, we went from non-pipeline computers to pipeline, super pipeline to super scalar, super scalar, super pipeline, out of order, and today we build computers I call massively predicted. We predict instruction fetch, instruction decode, branch prediction, call return, instruction grouping, we predict the data stream, load store ordering. We predict free fetching the L1 cache, the L2 cache. And the better the predictor, the better the computer. That's what really drives it today. And then on the other pieces, we've invented multiprocessors. We designed for high latency memory. There was a period of time when I was told, computers are going to hit the operating system performance wall because it's too complicated to code. We'll never make it faster. And then we make caches bigger. We improve memory latency. We improve prediction and that. Fell. We did 64 bits, multi-core, vector extensions. Um, it's just amazing how those transformations happened. And then if you take that in a combination with transistor, transistor count, uh, Bell's law states, Gordon Bell said, for every 10x improvement in computational power, you get a new kind of computer. So we went from mainframe to mini computer workstation. And some of those were transformations of how we use computers. And then there's another dimension, and I'm old enough. So that's a picture of a, a VAX 8800 board. And the VAX 8800 was built on eight boards of MSI parts and gate arrays with 200 gates in them. So we designed with schematics, we drew gates, we laid out boards by hand, right? And then the VLSI revolution happened where the best thing to do is get everything you could on one chip, and we designed at the transistor level of digital and we wanted to get every bit of performance out of the transistors we had, so we literally drew schematics with transistors. And that worked for a couple of years, but as the transistor count went up, the schedules became really hard and unpredictable. You couldn't manage it. And there was a big transformation to high-level RTL design, um, synthesis, CAD tools that actually worked. And then we had to 
put in place then big verification because the designs got way more complicated than they used to be. And now we're in the transition to building modular provable design. So we build a, a CPU even as a set of modules where each one has provable interfaces and we verify them independently. When we put them together, we manage complexity. And then coming soon, we're gonna build computers with AI, which is gonna be really interesting. So these are literally transformations on how we built a computer. Board design, BLSI design, RTL design, modular design are completely different methods. So that got me thinking about, there's a lot of discussion about the philosophy of science, right? And there's one theory of science which goes something like, you have data, that makes a theory. The theory predicts some experiments to do. You do the experiments which prove or disprove the theory. So that's the common theory of science. I think Karl Popper said that in the 30s. But Thomas Kuhn had a different thing which said, we operate in a paradigm. In a well-established paradigm, you know what the rules are. You can get a lot done. It's really useful for solving problems. And you tend to ignore the stuff outside of the paradigm or even defend against that until those anomalies pile up. And then there starts to be a revolution. The revolution changes everything. But in the beginning, it's a mess, right? Because you're doing a new thing with new ideas. And then you shift into the new science period where you start to work out the details. And then you shift into the new paradigm. And that's happened multiple times in computing. And AI is starting to drive some of those. So I wanted to talk about one paradigm shift I really love. And then we'll talk about some AI transformations. So the fabs, God bless them, give us more transistors every couple of years. And you think as something gets bigger, what happens? You get more, it gets more complicated. You get more components. Um, you start to get way too many blocks to put together. You have these expensive tape outs. The teams grow and grow. Some people experience really big schedule slips. And, and you find out you're not designing things the right way. And that's what drove the transformations from board design to VLSI design, the RTL, to modern SOC design. And I'm old enough to remember when all computer companies had a fab. Right, Digital had a fab, AMD had a fab, Texas Instruments had a fab, IBM was one of the leaders. And the big idea there was co-optimization. We used to sit down with the process guys and say, what do we need to do to make our CPU faster? And we'd talk metal stack resistance, edge rates, ID sats, and we'd go into low level detail about this. Nothing was portable from company to company. You had lots of locally designed CAD tools. Everybody was kind of building a narrow, weak stack. And the, the, the transistor count grew, that process just literally fell apart, right? And then Pure Play Fab was a revolution, right? And TSMC was the leader in this. But the thing that made it really interesting was there was a regular cadence, predictable when the next node's gonna come out, PDK schedules, and I, I have to say, the thing I love most about PDK is there was a 0.1, and then a 0.3, a 0.5, a 0.7, a 0.9. And you know, they said, with this PDK, a lot of things can change. With this one, less things can change. With 0.9, you can tape out. You know, you knew what the path was. There was a very open relationship with CAD companies and IP <coughs> vendors, which enabled IP libraries. I used to think TSMC had a library, but ARM and a couple other people had libraries, and they purposely enabled lots of libraries because if anybody screwed up, you could get it from somebody else, and they created a very reliable system, right? And the open relationship was key, and it changed how we built chips. And I, li I like this picture. I joke with some people that IP became almost like Home Depot. You can go buy IP and expect it to work, and there's so many options. There's tier one CAD companies, Foundries have IP, startups build IP, a lot of advanced nodes, like the new IP will be from a startup before it becomes popular. We do in-house development. You expect it to work, it's silicon proven. First pass, stuff like PCI Gen 5, 100 gigabit, 400 gigabit ethernet work, GDR6. These are complicated IPs, but the combination of shuttles, PDKs that are stable, reliable devices, tight process parameters, and predictable schedules cause a huge transformation. And I would say we went to the revolution where TSMC became a standalone foundry. 
but the new science period took 20 years to really work out the details of how that works. And we are now operating in the paradigm of foundry with reliable IP, reliable CAD tools. And I allowed TenseTorrent to do this, right? We took a very small team, 15 people in-house. We partnered with a third party to do physical and back end. Wormhole's our second generation part. It's actually on global, uh, global foundries. Uh, six partitions. We bought IP for GDDR6, PCI Gen 4, 100 gigabit ethernet. It powered on and worked the first time. We designed it to be really modular. We have our own in-house design NOC and our own AI processor. Those are very clean and plug and play. We leverage industry standard AXI. So we have a, a NOC, our NOC to AXI conversion widget. So we made that easy to do and we built this chip. Like this is the, you know, the end point of that new paradigm. Which is pretty exciting when you see it come together. And very different. I was in a startup not too long ago. We did our own DDR5, we did our own library, we did some of our own placement tools just back in you know, 20 years ago. And now startup, you never think to do that. So you can do these kinds of things. So now I wanna look at AI a little bit. So AI for people who don't remember started in the 60s and 70s, right? The theory was you write down the rules, you apply those rules to problems, and you get good answers. Right, and it started out promising and people wrote lots of papers and books on this. And then basically not much happened, right? And then computer vision went the same way. You wrote C programs to look at pixels and identify things like lines and points and edges and shapes. And then the combination of those would define whether you saw something. It was very hard and it didn't generalize at all. So the, the rule-based AI, the computer vision-based AI, moved us into what they called the AI winter, where for 20 years, uh, the conference now called NeurIPS, apparently would have 50 people show up every year and not much happened. And then there was an inflection point, like the revolution was AlexNet and a couple other networks like that where they used data to train a neural network to, to identify objects in an image and that conference apparently went from 50 people to 3,000 in four years. People started pouring into it, university research exploded. Everybody every year would take the best networks and then start to explore it with them. And then there's been a whole bunch of new science. We're in the new science phase of AI. So Inception, Transformers, ResNet, everybody is, is working on making incrementally better models but it still hasn't set that, settled down. And then a couple years ago when they published GPT-3, it was like another a revolution. What you can do with a simple software architecture and lots of data that starts to mimic what we literally think of as intelligence, which is really exciting. I don't know, how many people here got an autonomous drive to work this morning? I did. I, I obviously own a Tesla. I recently got a um, full self-driving beta version, which can drive me from my house to this hotel with no interventions. I have to say, it's, sometimes it's a little exciting. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what it's going to do all the time, but it does a, a pretty good job. And it tells you pretty much what's going on. It's a very nice vis visualization screen. So this is the, you know, Arndt Karpathy called this the software 2.0 vision, right? We use data to train models to do things identify objects, identify roads, features, predict behavior of things. We train models, we don't write very much code. Most of the models, because we hear about, oh, there's these big AI models and we talk to customers. There may be a lot of Python and PyTorch, but the core of the models is like 100, 200, 300 lines of code, right? And people tend to use the best models. So there's lots of models published every year, but when they start doing an implementation, they'll pick up ResNet or EfficientNet, or they'll use GPT-3 pre-trained and then do something with it. And it's actually starting to work pretty well. I was fascinated by this talk from OpenAI, where they showed using GPT-3 and some extensions that they were using AI to write code, right? So we went from writing code that executed 
maybe the way we want it or not, to using data to train models to identify things. Now we're using data to train models to write code. And this is part of the next really big transformation, which is going to touch us everywhere we do work in technology. So let's talk about what Tens Torrent's doing. And it struck me, we're building a new CPU. It's a RISC-V processor. We call it Escalon. And we're doing the classic innovation steps, right? We're working on a better branch predictor, high-performance vector unit. Uh, we're doing a very nice redesign of how out-of-order load store units work to make that really clean and execute really well. We're building it so it naturally builds into an eight CPU cluster. And then we have a cache coherent protocol on top of our NOC so we can build a bigger uh, cache coherent server. And we're also putting in features so that the processor itself, so this is a general purpose processor that runs like C programs, can talk with AI processors that run AI programs. Because we've seen instances where in the AI graph, you do some work, and then you want to give it to a C program. It does some work, and then hands it back. So we're going to have some additional features for that. But these are all innovations, not transformations. We started to think about, well, how are we going to use AI? We're in the AI business. How are we going to use AI to build CPUs? The CAD companies are already using AI in placement and routing to good effect. right? And we've decided to build our design really modular. So we have a performance model, a reference model, RTL implementation. And we're building it so all those pieces are modular at the same kind of boundary so we can move code back and forth. And I was talking to one of my verification guys, and he said, it used to be when we built verification test benches, we'd write a lot of code, and then in review, we'd describe how it works. And he said, now what I want to do is, Describe how the test bench works, and that automatically generate the code, right? And the AI code writing stuff is a natural vehicle to take human language descriptions of what you want to generate code. So we're building kind of some traditional description to code generators, and we're now starting to experiment with description using AI to do code generation. And then I predict that in the future, some parts of the RTL will also be done by AI. So in terms of that abstraction stack, you know, from transistors to gate level to RTL to high module design with provable interfaces, we'll have human descriptions of what we want using AI to do that. And each abstraction stack helps us manage the complexity as the fabs give us more and more transistors and we build more and more sophisticated designs. So I want to talk about a couple of low level features, which is kind of surprising. So if anybody's written a program, one of the first things you do is you go define your data. You say integer A, floating point C, and somewhere there's a location in memory, like a DRAM, with an address and that piece of data. We're so used to doing that, that all the data in the program is described by a variable with the location in memory. And if you want to modify it, you read A from this location in memory into a register, modify it, write it back. Makes sense, right? That's how data works. That's not how data works in AI. We take images, we take text, we take sentences, we take data, and we multiply them by convolutions or matrix multiplies, and we spread that data out. And we don't just do it once. GPT-3 is thousands of layers of multi matrix multiplies. The data is literally distributed across all the locations in memory in little teeny parts. It's almost like holographically represented out there, and one location in memory actually has the impact of many different datas and associations from that stack of matrix multiplies. It's a completely different way of thinking of data. You can't query A inside a deep neural network. You can, at the interface, ask a question about A, but that data no longer exists in the sense that we wrote programs for the last 50 years. It's an amazing transformation. Now, TensTorrent, we take advantage of that. Because it turns out when you do a matrix multiply, you know, big matrix, big matrix, you multiply them together, you're basically multiplying every number times every other number and summing it up. Turns out many of those results don't add up to anything. You get lots of zeros in the matrix, they call it sparsity. Our hardware can look at that sparsity and decide which calculations to do. And just to remember, like imagine the bank is doing a statement from you. You're hoping they don't like add up half of your deposits. 
and then say the other half of the deposits are too small to matter, or we don't care. Like, that's not how it works. Like, every single number there is something. But in an AI network, the data is distributed through memory, through these arrays, and you don't do operations that way. So we take advantage of sparsity, which is a different representation of data in an AI program than in a, a regular program. Here's a typical picture of an AI graph. So if you go Google, ResNet, Transformers, and image search, you'll, you'll find all these graphs. So it looks like a block diagram where there's one box that says matrix multiply or something, and it connects from one block to the other, right? And so in the blocks, a data transformation happens. The lines say data moves from place to place. That's a graph. And there's a couple ways to run this. One way is to run it like a program, right? Translate each module into a piece of code and then run those pieces of code in order. Right, and then if you want to speed it up, you might try to, like on a GPU, you get the matrix multiplied, run on more threads at once, or you might run some data in one GPU and some data in another GPU and then combine the results, right? But just think somewhere in that computer is a PC which has an instruction which says, go get this pieces of data, do this operation, store the result back to memory. Like that's how computers all work today. The other way to to run a graph is actually run it like a graph. All right, so this is the tens torrent method. There's some other people building AI computers like that. We take the software graph, instead of reducing it to a program that executes at a PC, we break it into chunks of computation and we lay it out like a compute assembly line. Like when you build a car at Ford, each station does a different transformation as the car goes through the assembly line. You don't build an assembly line with one thing that does everything in one spot. Car goes to the first station, you add a door. Next station, you add the other door. So you think about, take the compute and spread it out. So that's literally what we do. We take each node of the graph, we map it onto the number of cores it takes to do. Our 10 storm chips, our first two generations have about 120 cores on them. Right, a big matrix multiply might take eight cores, an element, operate add might take four cores. So we map it on the cores, right? The compute's all relative, and you can see that the computation goes to, the data goes to the first one, then the second one, then the next one, but it's fully pipeline. So when it's, once the data goes from the first core to the pile of cores to the second one, the next piece of data comes in, and it starts executing in a pipeline fashion. So the data moves through the array of processors, like a graph. Then I noticed this is kind of fun. Each stage has a computation time. So we size it partly to say this operation takes this much memory and this much compute. But we also look at how, much, how many cycles it takes. And then we balance the number of cycles of each stage because it's now executing like a pipeline computer. The data is moving through each stage at a certain speed. And the less cycles it takes, the higher the clock rate. So AI programs have a clock rate when they move through multiple processors, which is a completely different way to think of, I execute the program at the current PC and some routines take a long time, some take a short time, that's all okay, right? That's not the way we do it. Once you have a pipeline, your, your speed is set by the slowest operator and we go to some work to balance that out. So it's a different way of thinking about computing. We've noticed in a lot of the applications, we see Regular code, like video encoder, maybe software, maybe hardware accelerator, AI program, talks to another program, and it's, it's somewhat heterogeneous, right? So combination of different kinds of compute, that led us to build a chip which has a combination of different kinds of compute. So this is Black Hole, the chip we're gonna tape out um, in Q1 this year at TSMC. It's got DDR5 high performance, PCI Express, 400 gigabit ethernet. It's got an array of Tensic processors, which is our AI processor, but we also put an array of CPUs in there. And the CPUs can run both high-level code like operating systems, storage acceleration, networking, some data prep, but we've also built it so the AI processors can send data to the CPUs in the graph. They can work on it and then send that data back. Right, so the AI application changed data. It changed how we lay the program out also changes the combination of things we build in the chip and how that works together. So we started thinking about 
the next generation. Today, when people build an AI model, this is kind of amazing to me. Humans don't learn this way. You get a little more data, they retrain the whole network. When you learn something, you don't retrain your whole brain. You add that training to it. Um, and your brain is compartmentalized. You, you have a part that thinks about language, about vision, about moving around. So those are different models in your head that work together. And we're starting to see this in AI where somebody will use a GPT-3 model with some additional fine-tuned training. But we think the future is going to be AI models and other kinds of software programs working together in a harmonious graph. So that you do computation here, you send data to the next AI model. Those AI models may even look like IP. You get one AI model from one company, one AI model from another company, video co codec from a third company, and they work together. And then recently, Google published a blog on Google Pathways, which is an infrastructure so multiple AI models can work together and send data around. So this is how we think it's going to work. And our second and third generation chips, we call wormhole and then black hole, we built them with 16 you know, 100 gigabit and then 400 gigabit ethernet ports. That lets us build arrays of chips. And we're building a machine now that's 1,000 chips, 32 by 32 array. Then you can take AI models and lay them out across one, even part of a chip to many chips. Those AI models can then talk to each other as partition models. They can do one kind of computation one place and send it to another place. And they all work together in the same network. So this is, it's not like separate servers talking together on Ethernet asynchronously. This is a model, AI models talking to each other in an AI fabric. And that's, you can do this kind of thing because how AI models work. Okay. So paradigm shifts, you know, drive the transformations we've seen. And we've seen a bunch of them. Like, it was really interesting to think about the paradigm shifts that happened on what CPUs were and then we, how we built them. The foundry was one of the biggest paradigm shifts that impacted design ever. It kind of unleashed all these companies to do all different pieces and abstract the design. So you had foundry provide one piece, libraries, IP, and then customer solutions. It's a really big change. Um, I think personally that the AI shift is the biggest paradigm shift yet. It's going to impact everything we do, you know, from what we design to how we design to how we use that design. And TenseTorrent is working on disrupting that kind of computer architecture. We're not building computers that execute programs in order at a PC. We're executing, building computers that takes AI graphs, naturally lays them out as graphs, and then includes general purpose processing so the AI programs and the general purpose programs can work together. Like, we're in the middle of this shift, right? We're not in the, the new paradigm of AI design. We're very much in the revolution to new science phase where we're really figuring things out. But it's a really exciting space. OK, thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you. Here's a little gift. All right, I hope it's exciting. Yeah. <laughs> Three nanometers. <laughs> Coming soon. All right. Wait, let me. Thank you. All right, thank you very much.